This was supposed to go up a week ago. This move, so we just got back from seeing the Three Musketeers. So first impressions, this is not a serious movie. It's not meant to be. This is Musketeer Impossible. This is Musketeer Blonde. This is Final Fantasy III Assassin's Musketeer. <laughs> if you were looking for something serious, and after seeing the review, you've been wasting your own damn time. I have no sympathy. I mean, they have an airship. It's in the trailer. But we went to see this movie because we thought it would be a lot of fun, and it did not disappoint. We had a blast at this movie. Uh, and it's not one of the ones that you need to laugh your way through. You can. It's good. It make, it, it, it's It'll fun. It'll certainly help. But it's also fun in its own right. I mean, this movie is not interested in remaining faithful to the original plot. And it didn't need to be. No. This movie, if I had to say anything about this movie, I would say that, that it was interested in trying to cram as many big-name actors into it as it possibly could. Even if it couldn't get those big-name actors to show up. Indeed. So, we had um, Athos, who's trying to do his best to be Nicolas Cage. We have Aramis, who's doing his best to be Orlando Bloom. Which is particularly amusing. Because, because we actually had Orlando Bloom in this picture. Yeah, who is not doing his best to be himself, but that's another story. We had Porthos, who was busy being awesome. awesome. And then we had Cardinal Richelieu, who I swear... They wanted uh, to look like John Malkovich. But sadly, there is only one John Malkovich. Oh, and of course, we had, what's her name? Mila Jovovich. Yeah, okay, and of course, there was Mila Jovovich playing herself. I mean, Milady de Winter. I mean, Mila Jovovich. Okay, we had the Duke of Buckingham, who was played by Orlando Bloom, who had not much to add to this movie. Um... Other than being Orlando Bloom. And brandishing a potato peeler. Oh, God. No, a butterfly-bladed potato peeler. I'm not joking. Yeah. Okay. What was it? The story, as we've already said, isn't... There are... There are similarities in the story to the book, but this is it, high it, fantasy. It starts... It, it is high fantasy. It starts the same way that I think all musketeer, musketeer stories start. We meet D'Artagnan, he gets in a duel, then he moves on and he gets himself stuck in a duel with the three musketeers. He, they show up to duel, the Cardinal's men show up, they kick their ass, and then the plot moves on. Yeah, and from there the, from there, the plot uh, separates entirely. Um, to do. Some plots. Oh, uh, Aside, uh, so, yeah, there's a, the, okay, as far as subplots, there's the subplot of D'Artagnan's rise and joining the ranks of the, uh, the Three Musketeers. This is very underplayed. Pretty much by the time he meets up with them, he's almost on their level, and they accept him without too much. I mean, he shows up, he kicks ass, and he does a very good job, considering the previous time we saw him fight, we were thinking, how was he even close? Yeah. Um, he does get the climactic sword fight of the movie, but, um... It didn't even need to be him. I yeah. Mean, it, it, at that point, we hadn't gotten enough of just about anybody. It could have been easily been Athos, and it would have yeah. been understandable. Uh, second subplot, D'Artagnan's rise. Um, the whole thing of his uh, relationship with the Queen's... Uh, Lady in Waiting. Lady in Waiting. Constance. It really wasn't overwhelming. It was, we, got it was, some, we got some funny lines from, yeah, from Porthos that, you know... It was um, mainly a, a mechanism to move the plot along. The French have, the French, French women have a thousand ways of saying no, and only some of them mean yes. I mean, that was good for a really good laugh. It was, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there were two subplots that I really thought could have gone. Um, I really disliked the, the whole king asking D'Artagnan for advice. First off, because the first half of the movie has the king as this 
almost fashion designer fop who doesn't seem to care about anything outside of himself and throws temper tantrums like Ruby Rod, who, like, about a third to a half the way through the movie, suddenly manifests a real worry about his relationship with the Queen, and, you know, and it doesn't work. Um, and then you had the, um, screw France, let's go for love. Yeah, that, it was, there was no development to that. It just was kind of dumped in there. It, it wasn't very good. It just kind of came out of nowhere, and it didn't make much sense. Um, we, we did a shift on, you know, the, some of the Milady to Winter, which, which worked, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, um, I thought it was a much more interesting character than it has been in the past. Um, and then the, the final subplot, which, um, I think was a really fun part of the movie was the, uh, bosom heaving corset fun, which was everywhere. They took full advantage of the fa fact that they were in 17th century France to have just about every woman have a corset. Because and corsets were king. Yeah. Because there was, you know, nothing, nothing nothing more awesome than, you know, things that held up French breasts. I mean, the king yeah. loved that. <laughs> yeah, because there's nothing kings wanted to do more than hold up French breasts. Yes. Um... As we said before, this movie wanted to have big names in it. Um, Athos looked like Nicolas Cage, Aramis looked like Orlando Bloom, the Duke of Buckingham was Orlando Bloom, and Mila Jovovich was Mila Jovovich, and the Cardinal uh, looked like John Malkovich, but wasn't John Malkovich. Yeah. Um, the, the, I, if I had to have a complaint about this movie, is it really didn't know what it wanted to be. Uh, did it want to be high fantasy? Did it want to be, you know, uh, have self-aware comedic value? I mean, that's the thing. There are these brief moments in the movie where it has this really self-aware humor. Like when Aramis writes D'Artagnan's horse a ticket for crapping in the street. It's five francs. Yeah, I, it's a full-on ticket. I, it's these moments of very modern humor. And I think the movie would have actually been better with more of them. There are so few that it seems like a weird tacked on thing whereas if it had been more throughout it would have come off as more of a fun silly movie um later in the movie uh porthos and aramis are in a are in a cart crash it's fantastic where porthos shouts or no, no no one of them shouts above going you know i try to see the world from your point of view but i don't think i can get my head that far up my ass yeah it's it's the movie would have been better if it had just decided what it wanted to be. Um, and that's my opinion on the matter. Things to look out for. The aforementioned butterfly bladed potato peeler. Neither butterfly blades nor potato peelers had been invented at that time. And, Although, uh, to be fair, neither had airships. In uh, the Duke of, Buckingham's weapon, Duke of Buckingham's weapon cabinet, which is opened up, you see all of these fantastical weapons. And then you see... This blade attached to a gun handle. A sort of gun blade, if you yeah. will. It liter it's literally, it's a modern combat knife attached to a pistol handle. When you're watching the scene, look for it. It's in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, also look for a scene where um, two airships are charging each other. Directly towards each other. They're only powered by wind. What the hell kind of crosswinds are powering that collision? I know that's certainly not possible. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Um, there was something else I wanted to hit. The Musketeers are planning on how to get into the Tower of London when they come up with this brilliant plan. Right here. We attack tomorrow under cover of daylight. <laughs> daylight, sir? It's the last thing they'll be expecting. I'm not joking. They pretty much said it, almost word for word. But like we said earlier, um, there are flaws with this. Oh, they're definitely trying for a sequel. I, and it's a sad because I think the fact that the movie couldn't figure out what it wanted to be is going to mean it doesn't make enough to get said sequel. This is probably going to be an aborted franchise. I yeah. Think. Uh, it's a bit, and it's a really a bit of a shame because this movie was a lot of fun. Stupid fun. I mean... I really, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I sat down, 
I mean, the only problem we had is that we got restarted because somebody said the 3D wasn't on, but it was. Which actually brings me to a very important point um, that I haven't stated yet. I've had a problem with movies in recent years that, you know, we all tend to look back on movies with a bit of rose-colored glasses, but I've had a problem with focus on camera work in movies. You know, shaky cam. Shaky cam. It's the big one. We all know it. We all hate it. it it's stupid. It, it worked in uh, Blair Witch because it made sense. And then we got it in Born Identity. I'm sure and we it, got it in Alice, but that's the big one it. that I remember. We got it. It's in everything. Yeah. But it isn't in this movie. No. I mean, and then another yeah. thing that's been a problem is pan shots that blur. They didn't in this movie. No. And as we just said... We saw it in 3D. Yeah. There is not a single fight scene that I can recall in this movie where I couldn't tell exactly what was going on. And I want to leave you with this thought. Think back over all the action movies you've seen recently. How many of them can you say that for? So, I would encur I encourage you to go see this. Uh, if you like stupid, fun movies, this is one of them. Yeah. I would highly recommend you go see this. I mean... You will sit there, you can enjoy it, you can laugh at it. Yeah. There, there's no wrong way to enjoy this movie, except perhaps sexually. Leaving you with that, that horrible mental image, um, I'm Ram Nessus. I'm Albatross. This has been an instant movie review, and we're the Brothers Herman. Signing off.